Hi! Before this video begins, the editor has things he would like to say. It's a little important. Audacity deleted what he was supposed to say here, so shall take over. This script was written in April last year, recorded in September, and edited in January this year. Time flies by, it? Because of how long it took to make this. Some information is slightly updated. Corrections have been made to, uh, to make this as non updated as possible, but please point out any inconsistencies. So thank you. Now, without further ado, let's start. Very tall vegan. Uh, man, I can't wait to play some Vocaloid shit again. <laughs> Ah yes, uh, Hatsumiko and her friend Colorful Stage. Man, there's a lot of non-vocally characters here, I wonder why. Anyways, rhythm game, rhythm game. Just be friends. Classic, classic. Just guess I'll start with hard difficulty, I don't want to go too crazy. Team and leader. Sure. Okay, moving on. Wow, is this just Archaea? Except I'm um, not having an aneurysm? Yeah, that's good. Full combo, yes! Full combo, finally. Wait, wh what? What? Okay, I'll play that again. Okay, alright. Alright, alright, there's stores in this game. Customizing cool costumes to see in the game is pretty fun. Wait, what are those? Magic threads? What are those? How do I get those? There's props you can buy for a stat boost for your character. What? Wait, what? What the fuck? Stamps? Okay, I, I don't know what these do, but they do look cute. Okay, okay, I need to slow down. This rhythm game is possible and it's easy to get into and I see there is a song shop. Oh, fuck, another currency, fantastic. A mission pass, oh, it's a battle pass that resets monthly, okay, right. With some currencies and limited edition costumes or for $16, fucking hell, that's a rip off. What's this colorful plush shit? Oh, okay, oh my God, okay. Bunch more currencies I didn't know existed, bundles of stuff, accelerated rewards and even stuff just to not even play the fucking rhythm game. And you can buy all these subscriptions at the same time, 5, 10, 30 dollars. Okay, well, that's great. Right, not off to the best start. What's the story about? Okay, this is fucking boring. Go, every fucking group is just some weird Japanese idol cliche. I'm so fucking confused right now. Oh, my rhythm game score is determined by my character levels and to increase your character levels, you need to grind songs to level them up or earn these song notes that are given at a fucking snail's pace unless you use all your energy for a multiplier or buy some of our subs and passes to speed up everything all because of a fucking gacha. Okay, the rhythm game is, is fine. It's basic, it's easy to learn, it's easy to pick up and it's fine. But what's even the fucking point when your team level determines your score and not your skill? Why is there so many fucking currencies in this game? I can't get shit without giving roadblocks like this. Battle pass? You know what? If it's not better than Apex, just fuck off. The fact you need to pay more for this for less time to get shit, get out! The stories are so fucking cliche, a 14 year old could think up a better drama than this shit. Ah. Fuck this game! <laughs> Alright, I think I've been denying myself the fact that despite my poor first impressions, I do like Project Sekai, or Hatsumiki Colorful Stage. A little context, I'm very much a Project Diva player. Rhythm games aren't my favourite genre of games, but a game like Taika will immediately keep me engaged in order to hit those drum notes as perfectly as I can. Diva has a straightforward arcade hook to it, you just play songs to unlock more, and get currency to buy outfits and accessories for the characters, rinse and repeat until you've pretty much just had your fix. It was structurally simple, but was flexible enough for players to personalize the experience to themselves and have a great time, be it newbie or veteran. But Diva hasn't had a proper release, proper release, since 2016, and I'd become more disconnected from it, and by extension, Vocaloid a few years after. Colorful Stage's announcement didn't move me, and its Japanese only release only made me forget all about it, not helped by the aforementioned context. But in late 2021, I managed to get a Project Diva arcade running on my computer and fell in love with Vocaloid all over again. But that's a video for another time. 
with this return of interest, Sekai came back on my radar as it was to be released worldwide in December. Little did I know going in beforehand, Sekai acted as much more of a live service than a standard video game and the entry fee was the first sign. How about we revisit some of my complaints? Let's go through the main loop of Sekai. To start, while I don't have any footage, the game puts you on a narrative path almost immediately, having you choose whatever group you want to start with in the story. Now, we'll get to this after, but essentially you might start with this group of characters as your team, and your skills will be tested in Rhythm Game. This is Sekai's main form of gameplay, and by Rhythm Game standards, it definitely is one. The song selection, I'll give credit, is a lot more varied than I expected. As well as featuring songs from who you'd expect, they actually go beyond the Crypt and Six and feature songs sung by Aya, Ia, Gumi, V Flower, whoever this is, and more. This is much appreciated, because not even Diva went beyond the characters it had in its own games. In fact, let's play one right now! Variety is the spice of life! I'm stubborn and rarely went beyond what those games gave me for songs, so more diversity like this is really appreciated. Songs also often have covers sung by the in-game characters, and specifically commissioned songs for this game also appear, making for a total of 261 songs present in the already ahead Japanese version. It's not lacking in variety or content, that's for sure. Gameplay-wise, games like these aren't complex. They're easy to pick up by design. If you can press a button correctly, you can play the game. The difficulty comes from organized patterns of notes combining in such a way where the developers can ramp up the complexity until it becomes ludicrous. Sekai doesn't strive to be innovative. In fact, it's one of the more basic rhythm games I've played. All you have to do is hit the rectangles as they come into this little space on the bottom. There are hold notes, special gold notes, and swipes. These can merge together, but even its harder difficulties, of which I don't play yet, admittedly, it's noticeably less chaotic than Archaea, that's for sure. Not to say it's easy, oh no, it's still challenging. Choosing the game speed is also an option too, which is really nice in my opinion. Having the notes come down however fast you want is really good to learn. The game favours playing with multiple fingers on high difficulties, but I only play with thumbs because I'm playing on a lengthy phone and the screen space isn't favourable compared to a tablet or something. It's doable though. Songs are also shortened to be within the 1 minute 30 to 3 minute range of length, which is perfect for in and out sessions. Though, for background, there isn't much going on. Diva had these fully rendered original promotional videos to go along with the rhythm game, expressing spectacle and characterizing the song it was playing, while also making for pretty good eye candy. And other games may not have anything at all, emphasizing focus. Sekai isn't exactly consistent with this spectrum though. You can have 3D performances, being glorified dance routines though. There can be animated music videos made for Sekai, the song's original PV, and Light, being basically nothing at all. This all sounds pretty good, but the availability of any of these, say for Light, varies wildly. So for example, Miracle Paint has the original PV and the 2D, but not 3D. Bring It On has only 3D, even though it has an original PV. Nostalgic, 2D only. Disappearance, Odds and Ends, World is Mine, Zen Monzakura, and more recognizable ones even, have nothing. PVs for these get added over time, which is fine for new things we haven't seen, but confusing for stuff we have. The choice of what PV plays is very much appreciated, and something I would like to see in a future Project Diva, and I empathize with having to create new videos for songs that never had them in the first place. But that clearly isn't the case here. Was it that hard to implement the video for Senbon Zakura? Come on, guys. Now, despite this admittedly huge nitpick, Sakai's rhythm game is overall above average. There isn't really much to say, it's a simple, no fuss, straightforward rhythm game. Churning out a few songs while on the bus is feasible. Also, I like the result screen music is similar to the title screen music for Diva F. The game doesn't immediately kick you out when you play badly either. It lets you continue in exchange for currency, right where you left off and it has a fucking countdown when you unpause. Thank god, every rhythm game should have this. And if you willingly decide to quit a song, it doesn't charge you any energy for playing. That's quite generous, actually. In fact, you don't need energy to play at all. Many mobile games have an energy system to starve their players of content, so it's sure that they come back to get their fix. Sort of like drugs. So what's this game's use for? Well, it acts more like an XP booster rather than a virtual entry fee. When you finish a song, the amount of energy used determines a multiplier and it's applied to the reward quantities you earn, and the XP earned to your team. The higher level of your team, the higher ranks you can achieve. And this is kind of my fucking problem. Fuck, I hate this so much. The rhythm game is core to progressing your team into getting higher ranks, grinding out levels to unlock more of the story. Technically speaking, it should be a core aspect to the game, and it is. 
but it doesn't feel like it. Sure, there are co-op shows you can do with people online, but those are so underwhelming and don't even bother with rewarding seal that it's a red flag of the horrors to come. But to remain on topic, I'm not coming back to this rhythm game due to it being exactly engaging or anything like that. I'm coming back for it because my team needs to get the levels up and I want to unlock more of the main story to get my associated characters. There's not much for me to get invested in the rhythm game for me, not even on a customization level since characters with accessories only show up in some PVs. But that's okay, because there is a story to get invested in. And what's the first thing that comes into mind when I think of Vocaloid? Develop story and characters. From a conceptual level, Vocaloids aren't meant to have an official personality. This gives some producers creative freedom in the types of song they're morally allowed to create. Character designs and ages are meant to be used as thematic pointers for song material, but don't need to be strictly adhered to. And they don't tend to be. Point is, an official personality would limit creative freedom because there will be discrepancies over how a certain character is supposed to be portrayed. It's entirely up to the song producer. This is why Project Diva X is really weird. There are moments where the characters show a mere dust speck of personality, but there's seemingly a knock in the writer's room. What this creates are extremely static characters who adhere to very light stereotypes throughout the entire game. There is almost no change in the character's personalities, which should be bad for a story mode. However, it's what Vocaloid should be, so it makes the whole story mode as an idea baffling and incoherent, mm -hmm. and kind of fucking dumb. So, what about Sekai? You might have noticed that I'm playing two almost completely different games, where one is a rhythm game with cards and the other is a live 2D visual novel with lots of anime characters, very few of which are actual Vocaloids. No, 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 this game's concept is music bringing people together and the relationships that stem from them. And to explore these relationships in a more relatable and digestible fashion to the audience, original characters were created and made part of the overall world and narrative, while bringing Vocaloids in to emphasize the music relationships for all of them. Is what I assume this quote is trying to say. It sounds really mushy and sentimental, but just, just, just go with it. Alright, it's gonna work like this. I'm gonna use Leonid's main story as a sort of benchmark of what Sekai is more or less like. It'll explain most of the general aspects and rules in this to make explaining other stories easier. They're the only ones I've fully done for the story for, and the rest I'll just summarize since I've only done around half of each. Characters. Ichika, the group's vocalist, guitarist, and a lifelong Miku fan. She looks pretty cool, I guess, though she doesn't have much development or anything, but that's for later. Saki, a very social girl who's kind of an idiot sometimes, but there's a lot more developed. I'm not a fan, but yeah, this this one's this one's alright. Hanami. Drums. I like this one. She's just pretty sweet. She's so calm and nice and looks and sounds older than she is. She's just really, really sweet, you know? I like this one. Shiho. Bass is kind of bitchy, but it's born from her laser focus on musical perfection and lack of self-awareness towards others. She's fine. She gets way more development, honestly. The story with them is that they're a close group of friends that drifted apart as time went on, becoming increasingly disconnected going into their first year of high school. Three of them, actually, since Saki has been hospitalized for a number of years. It's not original, but it's a flexible enough premise for some very introspective character study drama of the breakdown of the relationships, the yearning of the past, and our internal refusal to let go of it. The realization of someone that holds everything together and taking responsibility of it. Being able to grow as a part, it's not that deep, is it? In this opening, we see a teenage Ichika trying to at least hold a conversation with Hanami and Shiho, and one is quite cold on the first impression, and it all seems hopeless, until Saki makes a surprise return from the hospital and immediately reconnects with Ichika, as if nothing has happened. It's a very heartwarming moment, and gets quickly shot down when Saki tries to talk to the others, and we're back to square one. Now, we're wondering what the fuck happened, and the trendy topic of Spotify playlists come up for some reason, and Ichika notices this unknown song called Untitled. I wonder what it does. Oh. When both come to, both of them have woken up into a strange world, an after school setting with the very early sunset peeking through. Going exploring, it seems Shiho and Hanami have ended up in this room via a similar method. Soon enough, they find this person. Yes, it's the one and only. She explains that this world is known as a Sekai, a world that manifests from your true feelings and Vocaloids are there to discover your true feelings. <laughs> Yeah, it's very much that kind of writing to be to be expected when in this world. The Vocaloids actually do speak dialogue in this game, and it's actually a good effort for as expectedly robotic as it is. The thought of playing music appears to Saki, and she starts encouraging it. Shiho wants out, and in short terms, Miku holds her at hostage until the song is played. So they do it. 
She her stops for attempt's sake, but they do it. And it's a good realization for everyone that doing this again was really fun and a cool experience. But hesitantly, she her wants out, and so does Hanami. Well, that was kind of awkward. But Saki and Ichika are determined to get their friend group back together and relive the old times. And this is the basis for Leonid's story, all set up in five episodes. They may sound like a lot, but episodes are relatively short, and out of 20, I'd say the pace is alright. And no, the summaries for these stories will not be this long. What I've outlined thus far is a basic structure for a drama story. Characters that seem different but are linked together somehow, the static factor that will drive the story forward, and characters having unknown, opposing, but probably realistic viewpoints which will inevitably cross and create conflict for our viewing pleasure. The hook to these stories is seeing how characters unfold and react to the contextual situations and internal struggles they face, in turn bouncing off each other and letting their reactions explain themselves. And in this story, it's alright. The motivations are clear, you want to see this group get back together, right? Right? Even if you don't, seeing Saki bounce around at the idea is enjoyable and the slow but continuous healing of this group is something uplifting to watch. Shiho herself is honestly a character I came to respect a lot more as a progress through the story. She's pretty cold at first, but you come to understand her reasoning and being less malicious than initially presented. And she definitely stands out from the game's cast in a pretty good way. Though I'd be lying if I said it was perfect, absolutely not. As mentioned previously, Ichika's kind of a nothing character. She kind of stands around and listening to characters talk or relaying information to them, and she was less interesting to watch compared to Saki or Shiho. She's kind of an audience surrogate, and apologies to any strictly Ichika fans, but nah, she looks cute, but no, not this one. Not a good character. One of my main stingy points is Hanami's reasoning for distancing from the group and the way one character goes about fixing it, which made me audibly say, oh my god, what the fuck is wrong with you? But... About Hanami, she's a sweet person, I'd love to have a friend like her, but when she first explains why she acts the way she does, there seems to be a lack of awareness about how fucked up her situation actually is on her end. A girl of her maturity should know better, and Shiho even says so. And from episode 12 onwards, the story basically shifts to how to get Hanami back. It's pretty stretched out. Shiho's reasoning was way more believable and consistent with her character. Aside from that criticism, the Leonid story is possible to good. It's not a masterpiece, nor did I expect it to be, but when I finished it, I was left with a feel-good story that was personal and intimate. I give it a cancer star sign out of 10. Alright, more more jump. Ah, it's the fucking idol group. Jesus. Minori, an energetic, strong-willed and determined girl dead set on becoming an idol, no matter how many times she fails auditions. Herika is charismatic but keeps herself in strict routines. A person who is able to be cheeky with others and has a craving for food is what the wiki says. I, I actually don't know about her that much at this point in the story. Airi, very strong-minded person. Airi is a very protective person that is hard on those close but means well. Also to me, she doesn't look like she's even from this game. She looks like she's from Love Live or something. A Shizuku, she looks really clean and pretty and often maintains a kind image but she's pretty kind of quirky. She's also very awful with technology and it's it's pretty funny, honestly. Going into this, I had my doubts. These costume designs look like the most cliche thing every Japanese anime idol group would wear, and experiencing a bunch of high school friends rise to idoldom isn't something I'm that interested in. And I'm glad I've only unlocked up to 10 episodes of these moving forward so I can get this shit over with. I need to stop speaking so soon. Wow, I'm sort of impressed. Impre Nori is a girl so determined yet inexperienced that she continues to apply to idol agencies, fail, practice on the school rooftop, seemingly ad nauseum. And it's here where the experienced former idols become inclined by that determination to help her win an audition. Now, I've only played this story in the 11 chapters I've unlocked, so it is a first impression, but damn, I got really into this. Especially because not everybody starts off on the best of terms, which seems a bit unusual for this type of story. But seeing as Haruka, Airi, and Chizuka are all former public entertainment figures, they have their reasons for distancing themselves from that world. And it's quite well juxtaposed with Minori's dedication to entering said world, which is not portrayed as all sunshines and rainbows. There is a running theme of idols being inspirations to others, and although it does sound cliche, it's quite interesting to see the irony of Minori inspiring those same people who've inspired her just by her sheer determination to be just like them. It's like seeing their own hard work accomplished, manifested into an entire human being, and it's very well done, so far. The characters are great too, Ari and Minori are standouts in this regard. The tutor and student dynamic they have is really good between the two. Shizuku also has her own struggles that you do sympathise with, because you don't like seeing that sad face, do you? Haruka's a bit of a mystery, her role isn't really clear in the story yet, but maybe it's because... I don't know, I just haven't seen much. Undetermined. 
I have almost nothing bad to say about it so far, other than Sekai moments are a bit more spaced out compared to Leonid. It's a stage concert thing and it's with Miku and Rin, but there's really not much here yet. But I'm actually pretty invested. I'll take the life size tapestry and acrylic stands. Ah, 10. Ooh, a trendy group, the band squad. I like the style. An is pretty much peak human. He's pretty, he's confident, high self esteem, social, trendy. Like, what more do you want in someone? Kohane. Literally the exact opposite. Shy, timid, aimless, self-loathing. She is surprisingly talented, apparently. Akito is a very determined and competitive guy. And hey, he's the first man in our game's roster. We didn't have many of those in this. Toya, another guy. He's a bit more quiet and more technical. He's Akito's partner, and he's pretty right, I guess. All right, I got assigned this first, and I kind of forgot about it. Playing it now, until episode 10, I like it. It's not as good as MMJ, but better than Leonid, for sure. Anne is a motivated spirit and the daughter of a very well-known musician in the street scene, whose event Red Weekend thing was such a good time that Anne wants to surpass it, but hasn't found anyone with applicable talent or motivation to do so. Until she meets Gohane, an unknowing, aimless girl who somehow, somehow, manages to impress Anne so much. They team up to achieve the goal and Kahane grows to be a better person. It's a different kind of story and while there are definitely personal stakes and ambitions here, it feels like we're following Kahane's discovery of a musical underground street scene and getting thrusted into participating in it. She absolutely stands out compared to the cast and that's intentional. The street music scene is something we discover with her. You get to know people's attitudes to certain things, how easy it is to express yourself and how opportunities are everywhere. Her seemingly constant necessity for Ahn to be there for her to sing just speaks to what kind of characters they both are. As for characters other than Kohane, Ahn and Akito are very much competing rivals with the same goal and seeing either of them fantasize about their ambitions with their partners lends <laughs> okay. Lend a sense of legitimacy to their objectives and attitudes, even if respect between the two isn't always positive. Toya is a little laid back right now, but we can tell he acts close to Akito, even questioning his actions. Sekai also gets ample screen time in these first 10 episodes too, Expl even explaining some aspects to it, like how untitled songs work, how they get transported there and shit. There's more here too, Miku's in all of them, but here we also have Len and Mako in a backstreet cafe. Rin gets added later on, but she isn't really there originally, and that's the case for a lot of the vocaloids in this. For downsides? I don't know. Kahane gets to sing faster than I'd have thought, but this is it's pretty nitpicky. I, I enjoyed this. Ah, oh, 10. Wonderland Deck Showtime. You guys like Disneyland? Sukasa, oh, I, I love this man. Every word that comes out of his mouth makes him sound like he's going to strike a Jojo pose. Bless him. Imu Otori. I, I may be judging prematurely, but I think Imu has some form of severe undiagnosed ADHD. Nene, she plays games and talks like a robot and hates people. Rui, I, I think this is the other person with actual undiagnosed ADHD. But he's super talented with engineering and stuff, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's hard to explain what this story is, it's really dumb at the beginning. Like, admirable characters, but extremely dumb. Sekai is here almost immediately and it's pretty funny how Tsukasa doesn't even believe it for a while. The characters are so outlandish and zany, it's just really fun to go along with. But seriously, having a theatre performance be thought up of with such silly practices only to take it 100% seriously once it's in motion and be invested in how the characters feel just shows how much you understand some of their ambitions. Even if some take it a bit too far, why am I invested in this? It's amazing what charisma does to someone. Like a good politician or brand manager, Tsukasa says so many extravagant and ambitious things with such passion that I'm not sure he actually says anything at all. Hence why he forgets his own reasons for being a leading actor. He's just that charismatic. Not knowing his limits is perfect. There's no major flaw so far in the 13 episodes I've unlocked. It's good so far. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it is good stuff. It is an admirable lack of safety. Out of 10. Night called at 25. Oh, who, who, these depressed lot. Kanade, someone who you could easily mistake for a neat and talks like this. Uh, Mafu, you. The first age in the first battle. What was Uh, Ina, artist ego person, si Akito's sister, which hey, is surprising, didn't expect familiar relationships. And Mizuki, she is, oh, sh Mizuki is my favorite, but deserves its own place, just, just give me a bit. Immediately, you can tell these aren't even in the same thematic playing field compared to everyone else. It's pretty much tipped the scales from Wonderland X Showtime's dumb and extroverted appearance to a moodier, more personal story, and likely the most complex. This story is about a decentralized group of people who have come together as a music group, communicating through an app called Nightcord. All play a part in creating this group identity called Nightcord at 25, which I feel like is, is grounds for in-universe legal issues. Anyways, Sekai is here pretty quickly with a unique spin. We've been told for all Sekai so far that it's been formed from your feelings, as in the character we're following. 
But here, we're explicitly told that it was formed from someone else's feelings, and the character we follow has to help that someone deal with it, which becomes the main goal for the story. So far, this story is very much more intimate and personal than any of the others, since I'd say none of these characters are going through the best times right now. Quite the opposite, really. Despite how friendly they all talk to each other and stuff, it's basically all four forms of depression. Two characters are elaborated on way more than the other two so far, but the stuff some characters are going through are pretty heartbreaking and somewhat relatable, depending on who you are. Sekai Wake plays up. a slightly different and more important Wake role up. here, and it's a really Wake good up. variation. I prefer this a lot more. I give it an unhealthy sleep schedule out of 10. So uh, I think we're done for the main stuff. What well, was previously seen as a soulless and kind of boring byproduct of we need to reward players somehow is actually one of the better parts of this game. But it doesn't end here. There's events and side stories which elaborate on either certain characters or just mix a bunch of characters together to have a good time. And the characters' cards also have stories to them too. And there is a wealth of world building and story here. And if that wasn't enough, the characters actually talk to each other in the hub world, even to different characters outside of their established groups. And these characters talk about so much random bullshit it feels like a consistent and populated cast of characters. It's pretty well done. You can also switch to each individual Sekai. Wait a minute. As you probably noticed, the actual Vocaloids, you know, the game's marketing mascots, take sort of backseat to all this storytelling. Japanese and Japanese-inspired forms of media with a character focused narrative tend to have an unusual, out-of-this-world element some characters interact with. This tends to be a sort of metaphor for the media's message, and this is rarely ever explained from a logistical standpoint. This is what the Sekais are, and is the only place where the Vocaloids appear physically to the characters. Now, they, they explicitly tell you, this place is your true feelings, and in the actual story, they act more as very admirable therapists. The Vocaloids here give more pointers to the game's cast so they can all fulfill their character arcs. And their personalities are as static as expected, even though they have some very, very vague forms of distinct persons. However, due to the role they play in the story, this is actually more of a good thing and doesn't feel out of place. It's as good as it can be, really, since they exist as the entities we know them as, synthesized singers. The same Vocaloid can have a different personality depending on what Sekai they're in, but the same general rules apply. I'd say this is a much smarter way of going about this than the narrative with Vocaloids thing. Also, they apparently join new Sekai as, as the game gets updated, which is pretty cool. Well, I mean, I, I kind of misunderstood this game, I enjoyed this. Maybe there is something of value after all here. Building game's a bit shit, but hey, I can live with that. Maybe this is a, this is a somewhat good game. As a game with the entry price of nothing on a platform with so many potential whales, I mean users, Sega needs to make their money back somehow. So in comes mobile's current favourite money making scheme. If it's not obvious, I'm not a fan of things like gacha or loot box monetization schemes dependent on luck and fueling your gambling addiction just for that PNG of an anime girl you probably didn't want. So we have a criteria to establish. And this criteria goes for many other games with luck based monetization. How much can I play before I need to spend money? Now, I don't mean this in the culling sense of pay to play, you can play Sekai in games like it without spending a penny. I mean, how much time must be invested until paying for in-game currency becomes a better option than without it? To answer that, we need to see what we're dealing with here. Man, this music is so- Oh, don't you love your gambling addiction? Aren't you gonna spend that money? You know you want to. Oh god, it's fucking annoying. If we go to this little menu on the bottom here, you can see all the probabilities for the cards you can get, guaranteed drop rates, and details on what the gacha is. This is a very transparent way of informing players. Much appreciated, colorful palette setting the bar pretty low here. Now, Sekai seems to be most similar to a consecutive gacha in technicality, since spending the 3000 crystals for 10 rolls instead of a single 300 guarantees a 3 star card. If you do the box spend repeatedly, you'll be well on your way to having a decent amount of 3 stars. This begs the question, how easy is it to get crystals? Well, it depends on what you do. You can play the stories, achievements, logging in daily and for events, talking to characters, playing the rhythm game, uh, debatably, exchange, and I'll get back to that. Increasing the character rank of various characters helps a lot, and it's just by doing things with them. Do this with alternating characters, and at the start, you'll have a solid income of gems at your disposal. More than enough to get 3-star cards of all the characters. And it's not like the elusive 4-star cards are impossible to get either. I have a few, and I haven't spent any real money. Now, at the start, I really shouldn't say this, but the stream of crystals feels a little bit generous at the beginning. It costs $25 for US for 3,000 crystals, which is quite expensive considering how easily you can tame them by just playing the game for like an hour and using the tactics I, mess I, I mentioned. I'm gonna keep that in. I hate stuttering. Now, the global version of this game is around a year behind Japan's version, so us and the rest of the world operate on an accelerated schedule, where events run for a shorter time in order to catch up to where the base version of the game is in Japan. Due to this shorter length, there's less time for players to earn crystals and get the event exclusive character cards. This might be a non-issue if you're starting out like I was, but imagine you did all this there really isn't much left to make you get more crystals aside from grinding songs, since all difficulties are essentially rewarded the same. Or paying up. That kind of sucks. 
I didn't understand what people meant by an awful income stream, but since I'm slowing down on what I need to do for challenges and character ranks, I'm feeling it now. Events going by so quickly, it feels like you need to be hardcore committed to this game. A game which kind of has a casual mass appeal. So to return to my question, getting to this slowdown point does take various hours of play, and interaction at your leisure, which is nice, but so is Diablo Immortal before it hits you with mortgage. These Garcha events therefore don't feel super memorable since they go by so fast. Not enough time to rank up and unlock event stories at your pace while having that feel of a life service. This is a very, very rare game where it's too consistently updated, if that makes sense. So when you get your shitty new cards, oh wait, shiny, oh I said shiny there, oh well. When you can assign them to your team to play the rhythm game with them and level them up. Or you can use multiple practice score sheets obtained from said rhythm game or event rewards to level them up faster. There's also a skill up scores, which increase characters' skills that take effect in the songs. Blah blah blah, you know, lots, you know, you get the gist of this shit. You go test them out on a song and you see this 3D PV. These characters can have costumes, but they can be found in the mall and bought using Oh for fuck's sake. Okay. I'ma get right to it. There is Way too many fucking currencies for niche and specific things in this game, like, way too many. It's not even padding, it's just a roadblock, and an annoying one at that. It's clearly to mask a lack of gameplay content under the impression of, wow, there's so much to do. Just having a few currencies and not a metric ton, it makes me less annoyed. Ah, oh, fuck. Moving on, I mentioned how the gacha is intertwined with your gameplay score and how I mildly dislike it. Now, hear it from my perspective. If your score is mostly dependent on how powerful your cards are, skill is very much diminished in the grand scheme of things, even if your reward is slightly more for full combos. However, let's move to co-op where you can play with other people. Imagine a scenario where someone plays on the same difficulty as you on a song. You get a full combo, and they mess up a few times. You can even see it on the top left. The results come in, and they're labeled MVP. They even have a higher score than you. Why? Because they, they have better cards than you, that's why. They're the MVP from the outset, and that moniker is just so fucking useless then. Now, I understand it's not exactly a competition, and Sekai's design philosophy is to allow anyone to play, regardless of skill level. But there is something quite discouraging about a system that only rewards players who have the higher level cards by playing more or paying more. I don't know, maybe I have a fragile Liga, but it's just consequences of this game's approach to accessibility for me. Now, let's say you've saved up enough crystals for a bulk purchase for a guaranteed 3 star card. All of it's pulled, everything's a duplicate of shit you already have. What then? I'll introduce you to this green room, a place where any duplicate cards can be traded in for wish pieces. Oh, fuck! Wish pieces, which can be easily exchanged in the shop for other in game items, most notably a voucher which lets you participate in another gacha where a three star card is guaranteed. See, it's still a gacha, so it's randomized, but hey, it's, a good, it's good they let you try again. Uh, this leads me on to that exchange thing. As well as wish pieces, you can go into this little menu here and exchange certain pieces of currencies for items. Currencies such as event points, received during events, and you can get a whale load of good stuff here. Crystals, gems, intermediate practice sheets, a lot. Gacha stickers are sort of the same, but are seemingly harder to get. Yeah, they are much more valuable. Voucher exchange is like that three-star guaranteed gacha, but you get to choose what cards you want, which, hey, is pretty nice. But the game almost never gives you these specific vouchers out, so fuck it. And that's how this entire game mostly works on an economical level. The Gacha plus rhythm game mix really is, is not for me. I, for one, like being fairly rewarded and greeted on my performance, not because how avidly I play or spend on this game. There is just way too many currencies for my liking. Even if I have some good benefit, most really feel like roadblocks. Despite its frequent and consistently generous income of main currency at the start, it feels less significant due to how many other currencies there are. And being hit with the, hey, you need other currencies, is dreadful. Colorful Plus and that Battle Pass thing, I it's, it's still a ripoff. It's not it's not my money, but who cares? But if you think paying $16 in order to spend your time and money in a randomized casino of things to make you pay more and win better, then may I interest you in Enter the Gungeon? It pushes me away almost, so we'll see how it pulls me back in. The constant upbeats given to this game aside from the gacha mainly come in the form of events. As previously mentioned, they generally feature a story focused primarily on one or a few characters from the game's cast. These event stories are unlocked by playing the rhythm game, but in a separate menu where your earnings whittle down a number to unlock the next chapter. This is where the aforementioned event points are earned for you to use in the exchange, and there are always some exclusive cards to earn here. These event stories themselves are very appreciated pieces of consistent content, giving players mostly what they like about the world made here. A lot of them delve a bit deeper into the individual characters, imprison marionette, sees Kanade and other characters get closer to understanding someone who's mentally off the deep end, and Ina doesn't come off as a nice person here, but it's mainly due to lack of understanding. But it's not always this detailed and personal. We tells are fun too, and there are straight up just fun stories such as the sports festival, and it's just a good time. Now, here's something interesting, I guess, but we've got to go back. 
Uh, Miko Expo Europe happened in January 2020 in Brixton, the friendliest and most aspiring area of London. It was probably a good event, I didn't go, but I did go to the 2018 one, which was fun, admiring all the cosplayers I was too scared to ask pictures for, buying a shirt, meeting an online friend. It was a good show. But why am I telling you this? Well, since Miko Expo is just streamed now and therefore missing some spirit, Colourful stage is a feature which, for me, slightly heals that missing wound of mine. Live shows are virtual concerts which you can join when an event reaches its end, or some special occasion regarding the game like a character birthday show, etc. You get put into a hub area with a blank avatar that you can customise a virtual court. Now, you can do a few things here, but the video is getting a bit long, so let's hurry this up. A downside is that the shows adhere to only one time zone, so some people may be out of luck for attending. But I think that sort of makes attending them a bit more special. Controls are definitely to start with. Initially, you look around using the mobile device gyroscope, though this can be turned off. I think a VR mode could be amazing for this mode since it's also in first person. The standard formula is that characters come on, talk to the audience for a bit and set up like a little story and then it's showtime. You can do a few things here like some actions and moves, do a throwy action with your glow sticks, like, you know, Fortnite emotes and shit like that. The song plays with a scripted performance by the characters and you basically have to fight to get up front and not be obscured by other players. Yeah, there's other players here with you. When you do that though, there's definitely a full-on virtual type of concert you're partaking in. When the chorus drops, there's a prompt to jump and the chaos from everyone doing it is fun to watch and fun to be a part of. It tends to be just one song though, so it gets finished, characters complete the story arc and then the show is over. I may have described it in a bit of a rushed way, but that's really all there is here. However, I'm not complaining. The prospect of attending virtual concerts with your friends or just strangers online to have fun watching characters you like perform songs you love is a compelling one. It brings us together in the, to enjoy all this and that's all we can ask for in these trying times. And concerts aren't just relegated to the virtual world of this game. Just this past January there was an in-person concert in Tokyo where characters from the game performed songs from the game in front of a huge audience only a year and a bit after its initial Jap Japanese release. I love stuttering. In fact, I have completely misunderstood this game's reach. In 2021, this was the ninth most talked about game on Twitter. They even do things outside of both as a way to push this game as a world. Notably, there was a 24 hour livestream of the Nightcore group sitting down in their definitely not Discord app that they use, and they just work. They do their own thing, exchange files and shit, talk to each other for a little bit. This type of content isn't at all necessary, but they do it because hey, why not take a look into the work process of the group? It's pretty interesting. So this game is absolutely doing wonders for providing for its fans in both inside the game and out of it. Voice actors needing to double up as vocalists, or vice versa, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, with a roster of like this is a lot to ask, but content wise it's paying off. I can admit there is effort in this, consistent content and elaborate events to look forward to. You kind of need to admire it, that's not the, that's not where I wanted to end. Well shit, started off this video heavily disliking this game, but after assessing most of its parts, it's actually a rather competent effort by Colourful Palette. There's, there's, there's no way this is a fucking good game. No, 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 no. They may not be the same game and appeal to completely different audiences and completely different completely philosophies, but D.Va is much better as a game. Sekai is not topping that shit. You know, the rhythm game is game. Sekai rhythm game is overall above average. And the story is very surface level. I'd say this is a much smarter way of going about this than the narrative with Vocaloids thing. Well, the gacha is, um, Okay, it's a gacha and the light service is just- I can admit there is effort in this. Oh, for fuck's sake. Alright, goddamn it. I can't bring myself to dislike this game. It just does a lot well for a freemium game. I mean, it's not that different from D.Va. It's a, it's a spin-off anyway, so you can still customize outfits for 3D PV, so I'm morally obligated to put my surrogate daughter in every single- Uh, wait a minute. She's not here. Alright, properly. Fuck this game. I uninstalled it. Bye-bye. Hey, you have, um, you've made it to the end of the video. Hi, um... It's three in the morning of the day of upload, and I'm, I'm doing this in the night. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry for that sound out there. It's a, it's a smoke machine or some shit. I can't get it to turn off. I'd uh, like to thank Deidre Draws for um for drawing the thumbnail. It was it's really good. It's exactly what I wanted to do, and I, I still need to pay her back for that commission. I'd like to thank my mate for letting me use his home studio. He offered to because he knew I was doing this, and he wanted me to see if it turned out something good. Even though I took like three fucking hours to to record all this at his house. I'd like to thank Miku Expo for still hosting a free trial of Miku V4X. I, I don't know why and it was on their their Brixton, their Europe um, page. It was really funny and it's how I got Miku in the beginning. It was really fun. I, I liked using it. It was so much fun. I'd like to thank Sekai for introducing me to these new songs and letting me make this video because of I was a really petty man child. I'd like to thank Sega for porting D.Va, Project D.Va, Mega Mix Plus to the PC, but please fix the fucking stuttering issue. 
there may be a follow-up video on this game which is more updated review there's gonna be stuff I didn't mention you know updated like views on this there's gonna be some recording outtakes in there if that happens so yeah maybe look forward to that if I ever go ahead with it with that being said it's it's been a long while since I uploaded last and I'm gonna be honest I don't know when the next time I'll upload is so I hope that this one was worth it and I, I enjoyed making it it was really fun I got to rail on this game so much but uh, anyways yeah um goodbye see you later